this dotage of our generals o'erflows the measure. Those his goodly eyes that all the files and musters of the war have glowed like plated Mars, now bend, now turn, the office and devotion of their view upon a tawny front. His captain's heart, which in the scuffles of great fights hath burst the buckles on his breast, renegues all temper, and has become the bellows and the fan to cool a gypsy's lust. Take but good note, and you shall see in him the triple pillar of the world transformed into a strumpet's fool. Behold and see. If it be you love indeed, tell me how much. There's beggary in the love that can be reckoned. I'll set a on how far to be be loved. Then must thou needs find out new heaven, new earth. News, my good lord, from Rome. Great me. <laughs> the sum. <laughs> Need the other man to name? Fulvia, perchance, is angry. <laughs> Or who knows that the scarce bearded Caesar hath not sent his powerful mandate to do this or this, take in that kingdom and enfranchise that, perform it or else we damn thee. Oh, my love. You must not stay here longer. Your dismission is come from Caesar, therefore hear it. Antony? As I am Egypt's queen, thou blushest, Antony. And that blood of thine is Caesar's homage, or else so thy cheek pays shame when shrill-tongued Fulvia scolds. Oh. The messenger. <laughs> Let Rome and Tiber melt, and the wide arch of the ranged empire fall. <laughs> Here is my space. Kingdoms are clay. Our dungy earth are like these beasts as man. The nobleness of life is to do thus. And such a mutual pair, and such a twain can do it, in which I bind on pain of punishment the world to eat. We stand up peerless. <laughs> Excellent falsehood. <laughs> Why did he marry Fulvia and not love her? I have seen the fool I am not. Antony will be himself. But stirred by Cleopatra. Oh, no, for the love of love and her soft hours. Let's not confound the time with conference harsh. There's not a minute of our lives should stretch without some pleasure now. What sport tonight? Mm -hmm. Here, the ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friendly queen, whom everything becomes. To try to love, to win, whose every passion fully strives to make itself in thee fair and admired. No messenger but thine, and all alone tonight, we'll wander through the streets and note the qualities of people. Oh, come, my queen. Last night you did desire it. <laughs> Speak not to us. <laughs> is Caesar with Antonius prize so slight? Sir, sometimes when he is not Antony, he comes too short of that great property which still should go with Antony. I am full sorry that he approves the common liar who thus speaks of him at Rome. But I will hope of better deeds tomorrow. Rest you happy. Oh, Lord Alexis! Sweet Alexis, almost anything Alexis, most absolute Alexis. <laughs> Where's the soothsayer that you praise so to the Queen? <laughs> soothsayer! <laughs> Your will. <laughs> Is this the man? It's you, sir, that know things. In nature's infinite book of secrecy, a little I can read. Show him your hand. Bring in the banquet quickly. Wine enough, Cleopatra's health to drink. Good sir, give me good fortune. I make not, but foresee. Good. Come now, some excellent fortune. Let me be married to three kings in a forenoon and <laughs> widow them all. Let me have a child at 50 to whom Herod of Jury <laughs> may do homage. Find me to marry with Octavius Caesar and companion me with my mistress. You shall outlive the lady whom you serve. Oh, excellent. 
I love long life better than fish. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty. How many boys and wenches must I have? If every of your wishes had a womb and fertile every wish, a million. <laughs> oh, fool, I forgive thee for a witch. You think none but your sheets are privy to your wishes. Oh, no, <laughs> Tell our affairs. We all know our fortune. Mine and most of our fortunes tonight shall be drunk to bed. There's a palm presages chastity, if nothing else. <laughs> Even as the all-flowing Nihilus presages famine. <laughs> <laughs> Your fortunes are alike. But how? But how? Give me particulars. I have said. Am I not an inch of fortune better than she? <laughs> and if you were but an inch of fortune better than I, where would you choose it? <laughs> <laughs> not in my husband's nose. <laughs> Our worse are thoughts, heaven men. <laughs> Alexa, mm. come. His fortune. <laughs> His fortune. <laughs> Oh, let him marry a woman that cannot go. <laughs> Lies, I beseech thee, and let her die too and give him a worse. And let worse follow worse, till the worst of all follow him laughing to his grave. <laughs> Fifty fold a cuckold. Good eyes. <laughs> hear me this prayer. Amen, dear God. Hear this prayer of the people. <laughs> Hush. Here comes Antony. Not he, the queen. Saw you, my lord? No, lady. Was he not here? No, madam. He was disposed to mirth, but on the sudden a Roman thought hath struck him. Inabarbus. Madam. Seek him and bring him hither. Where's Alexis? Here, at your service. My lord approaches. We will not look upon him. Go with us. Fulvia, thy wife, first came into the field. Against my brother Lucius. Aye. But soon that war had ended, and the time state made friends of them, jointing their forces against Caesar. Well, what worst? The nature of bad news infects the teller. Now, when it concerns the fool or coward, oh, who tells me true, though in his tale lie death, I hear him as he flattered. Nabianus, this is stiff news, hath with his Parthian force extended Asia. From Euphrates, his conquering banner shook. From Syria to Libya and to Ionia, whilst... Antony, thou wouldst say. Oh, my lord. Oh, speak to me home, it's not the general tongue. Name Cleopatra, though she's called in Rome. Rail thou in Fulvia's phrase, and taunt my faults with such full license as both truth and malice have power to utter. Thou fare thee well a while. At your gracious pleasure. The man from Sicyon stands upon your will. Oh, let him appear. These strong Egyptian fetters I must break or lose myself in dotage. What are you? Fulvia, thy wife, is dead. Where? In Sicyon, her length of sickness, with what else more serious importeth thee to know, this bears. For Ben. There's a great spirit gone. Thus did I desire it. She's good, being gone. I must, from the sin, chanting queen break off. Ten thousand arms more than the ills I know my idleness have had. Oh, no. Inabobus. What's your pleasure, sir? I must with haste from hence. Why? Then we kill all our women. We see how mortal an unkindness is to them if they suffer our departure. Death's the word. I must be gone. Cleopatra catching but the least noise of this dies instantly. I've seen her die twenty times upon far poorer moment. She is coming 
Postman's thought. Relax, son, no. Her passions are made of nothing but the finest part of pure love. Would I had never seen her. Oh, sir. Then had you left unseen a wonderful piece of work, which not to have been blessed with all would have discredited your travel. Fulvia is dead. Sir? Fulvia is dead. Fulvia? Dead. Why, sir, give the gods a thankful sacrifice? If there were no more women but Fulvia, then had you indeed a cut and the case to be lamented. This grief is crowned with consolation. And indeed, the tears live in an onion that should water this sorrow. And the business you had broached in the state cannot endure my absence. And the business you have broached here cannot be without you, especially that of Cleopatra's, which wholly depends on your abode. Now, no more light answers. Let our officers have notice what we purpose. I shall break the cause of our experience to the Queen. And get her leave to part. For not alone the death of Fulvia, with more urgent touches to strongly speak to us, but the letters, too, of many our contriving friends in Rome. Petition is at home. Sextus Pompeius had given the dare to Caesar and commands the Empire of the Sea. Our slippery people, whose love is never linked to the deserver till his deserts are passed, begin to throw Pompey the Great and all his dignities upon his son. Say, our pleasure. To such whose places under us require our quick remove from hence. I shall do so. Where is he? I did not see him since. See where he is. Who's with him, what he does. I did not send you. If you find him sad, say I'm dancing. If in mirth report that I'm sudden sick quick and return. Madam, methinks if you did love him dearly, you do not hold the method to enforce the like from him. Why, what should I do? I do not. He all things give him way. Cross him in nothing. That teaches like a fool the way to lose him. Tempt him not so too far. I wish forbear. In time we hate that which we often fear. But here comes Antony. I am sick and sullen. I uh, am sorry to give breathing to my purpose. Help me away, dear Carnion. I shall fall. It cannot be thus longer. The sides of nature will not sustain it. No. My dearest queen. I pray you stand further from me. What's the matter? I know by that same eye there's some good news. What says the married woman? You may go. Would she had never given you leave to come. Let her not say it is I that keep you here. I have no power upon you. Hers you are. The gods best know. No, oh, never was the queen so mightily betrayed. Yet at the first I saw the treason slander. Your Why should I think you can be mine and true, though you in swearing shake the throned gods who have been false to Fulvia? Riot as madness to be entangled with those mouth-made vows which break themselves in swearing. Most sweet queen. Nay, pray you. Seek no colour for your going, but bid farewell and go. When you sued staying... Then was the time for words. No going then. Eternity was in our lips and eyes. Listen, our brows bent. None our parts so poor but was a race of heaven. They are so still. Or thou, the greatest soldier of the world, art turned the greatest liar. Oh, now, lady. I would I had thy inches. Thou shouldst know there were a heart in Egypt. Hear me, Queen. The strong necessity of time commands our services a while, but my full heart remains in use with you. Our Italy shines o'er with civil swords. Sextus Pompeius makes his approaches to the port of Rome, and quietness grown sick of rest would purge with any desperate change. 
My more particular, and that which most with you should save my going, is Fulvia's death. Though age from folly could not give me freedom, it does from childishness. Can Fulvia die? She's dead, my queen. Oh, most false love! Where be the sacred vows thou shouldst fill with sorrowful water? Now I see, I see in Fulvia's death our mine received shall be. Oh, quarrel no more, but be prepared to know the purpose that I bear. By the fire that quickens Nihilus' slime, I go from hence by soldier servant, making peace of war as thou offend. Cut my lace, come, young cut! <laughs> Let it be. I am quickly ill and well, so Antony love. My precious queen, forbear. And give true evidence to his love, which stands an honorable trial. Ooh. So Fulvia told me. I prithee turn aside and weep for her. Then bid her dear to me and say the tears belong to Egypt. Good. I'll play one scene of excellent assembling and let it look like perfect honor. You'll heat my blood no more. You can do better yet. No. But this is me. By my soul. And target still he mends. Look, prithee, Carmian, how this Herculean Roman does become the carriage of his chief. I'll leave you, lady. Courteous lord. One word. Sir, you and I must part, but that's not it. Sir, you and I have loved, but there's not it that you know well. Something it is I would. Oh, my oblivion is a very Antony, and I'm all forgotten. But that your royalty holds idleness, your subject, I take you for idleness itself. To sweating labor to bear such idleness so near the heart as Cleopatra this. Sir, forgive me, since my becomings kill me when they do not I well to you. Your honor calls you hence, therefore, be deaf to my unpitied folly. And all the gods go with you. Upon your sword sit laurel victory. And smooth success be strewed before your feet. Let us go. Come. Our separation so abides and flies. That thou residing here goest yet with me, and I hence fleeting. Here remain with thee. Away. You may see Lepidus and henceforth know. It is not Caesar's natural vice to hate our great competitor. From Alexandria, the news is this. He fishes, drinks, and wastes the lamps of night in revel. Is not more manlike than Cleopatra, nor the queen of Ptolemy more womanly than he. Hardly gave audience, or vouchsafe to think he had partners. You shall find there a man who is the abstract of all faults that all men follow. I must not think there are evils in our to darken all his goodness. His faults in him seem as the spots of heaven, more fiery by night's blackness, hereditary rather than purchased. What he cannot change than what he chooses. You are too indulgent. Let us grant it is not amiss to tumble on the bed of Ptolemy, to give a kingdom for a mirth, to sit and keep the turn of tippling with a slave, to reel the streets at noon and stand the buffet with knaves that smell of sweat. Say this becomes him, as his composure must be rare indeed, whom these things cannot blemish. Yet must Antony in no way excuse his soils when we do bear so great weight in his likeness. Here's more news. Thy biddings have been done, and every hour, most noble Caesar, shalt thou have report how tis abroad. Pompey is strong at sea, as it appears he is beloved of those that only have feared Caesar. To the ports the discontents repair, and men's reports give him much round. I should have known no less. It hath been taught us from the primal state that he which is was wished until he were. And the ebb man ne'er loved till ne'er worth love comes deared by being lacked. This common body, like to a vagabond flag upon the stream, 
goes to and back, lackeying the varying tide to rot itself with motion. Caesar, I bring thee word. Menecrates and Minas, famous pirates, makes the sea serve them, which they ear and wound with keels of every kind. Antony, leave thy lascivious wassails. When thou once was beaten from Medina, at thy heels did famine follow, whom thou foughtst against, though daintily brought up, with patience more than savages could suffer. Thou didst drink the stale of horses, and the gilded puddle which beasts would cough at. Thy pallet then did deign the roughest berry on the rudest hedge. Yea, like the stag when snow the pasture sheets, the bark of trees thou browsedst. On the Alps, it is reported thou didst eat strange flesh, which some did die to look on. And all this was born so like a soldier that thy cheek so much as light not. Tis pity of him. Let his shames quickly drive him to Rome. Tis time we twain did show ourselves in the field, and to that end assemble we immediate council. Pompey thrives in our idleness. Farewell. Farewell, my lord. What you shall know meantime of stirs abroad, I shall beseech you, sir, to let me be partaker. Doubt not, sir. I knew it for my bond. <laughs> drink, Mandragora. Why, madam? That I might sleep out this great gap of time my Antony is away. You think of him too much. Oh, it is treason. Madam, I trust not so. Thou? You not Marian. What's your highness pleasure? Oh. Not now to oh. hear these sing. I take no pleasure in aught an eunuch has. Tis well for thee that being unseminar. <laughs> Thy freer thoughts may not fly forth of Egypt. Hast thou affections? Yes, gracious madam. Indeed? Not indeed, madam, for I can do nothing but what indeed is honest to be done. Yet have I fierce affections, and think what Venus did with Mars. Oh, Carmion, where thinkest thou he is now? Stands he or sits he, or does he walk, or is he on his horse? Oh, happy horse, to bear the weight of Antony. Do bravely, horse, for what's thou whom thou movest? The demi-atlas of this earth, the arm and burgonet of men. He's speaking now, murmuring, where's my serpent of old Nile? For so he calls me. Now I feed myself with most delicious poison. Think on me that am with Phoebus amorous pinches black and wrinkle deep in time. Broad-fronted Caesar, when thou wast here above the ground, I was a morsel for a monarch. And great Pompey would stand and make his eyes grow in my brow. There would he anchor his aspect and die with looking on his life. Antony! Sovereign of Egypt, hail! How much unlike. Art thou, Mark and <gasps> Yet coming from him, that great medicine hath with his tinct gilded thee. How goes it with my brave Mark Antony? Last thing he did, dear queen, he kissed the last of many double kisses, this orient pearl. 
His speech sticks in my heart. Mine ear must pluck his scent. Good friend, quoth he, say the firm Roman to great Egypt sends this treasure of an oyster, at whose foot, to mend the petty present, I will piece her opulent throne with kingdoms. All the East, say thou, shall call her mistress. So he nodded, and soberly did mount an arm gaunt steed, who neighed so high that what I would have spoke was beastly dumb by him. <laughs> What? Was he sad or merry? Like to the time of year between the extremes of hot and cold, he was nor sad nor merry. Oh, well divided disposition. Note him, note him, good Carmen, tis the man, but note him. He was not sad, for he would shine on those that make their looks by his. He was not merry, which seemed to tell them his remembrance lay in Egypt with his joy. But between both, oh, heavenly mingle. Beest thou sad or merry, the violence of either thee becomes, so does it no man else. Mettest thou my post? Aye, madam, twenty several messengers. Why did you send so thick? Who's born that day when I forget to send to Antony shall die a beggar? Ink and paper, Carmion. Welcome, my good Alexis. Did I, Carmion, ever love Caesar so? <laughs> oh, that brave Caesar. Be choked with such another emphasis. Say the brave Antony. The valiant Caesar. By Isis, I will give thee bloody teeth if thou with Caesar paragon again, my man of men. By your grace's pardon, I sing but after you. My salad days, when I was green in judgment, cold in blood to say as I said then. But come, away. <laughs> Get me ink and paper. He shall have every day a several greeting. Or I'll un the people If the great gods be just, they shall assist the deeds of justice men. No worthy Pompey, that what they do delay, they not deny. <sighs> Whilst we are suitors to their throne, decays the thing we sue for. The people love me and the sea is mine. My power's a crescent and my auguring hope says it will come to the full. Mark Antony in Egypt sits at dinner <laughs> and will make no wars without doors. Caesar gets money where he loses hearts. Lepidus flatters both. <laughs> Of both is flattered, but he neither loves nor either cares for him. Caesar and Lepidus are in the field. Huh? A mighty strength. I can. Where have you this? It's false. From Sylvia, sir. He dreams. I know they are in Rome together, waiting for Antony. But all the charms of love, salt Cleopatra, soften thy wan lip. Let witchcraft join with beauty, lust with both. Tie up the libertine in a field of feasts. Keep his brain fuming. Epicurean cooks sharpen with cloyless sauce his appetite. That sleep and feeding may prorogue his honor, even till a lethe dullness. Sir, shall... where are you? Anna, where are you? Antony is every hour in Rome expected. Venus. Ah. I did not think this amorous surfeiter would have donned his helm in such a petty war. His soldiership is twice the other twain. But let us rear the higher our opinion, that our stirring can from the lap of Egypt's widow pluck the ne'er lust-wearied Antony. I cannot hope that Caesar and Antony shall well greet together. His wife that's dead did trespasses to Caesar, his brother ward upon him, although I think not moved by Antony. I know not, Venus, but their fear of us may cement their division and bind up the petty difference. Come, Venus. I learn you take things ill which are not so, or being concerned you're not. I must be laughed at if or for nothing or a little I should say myself offended, and with you chiefly in the world. More laughed at that I should once name you derogately, when to sound your name it not concerned me. My being in Egypt, Caesar, what was it to you? 
No more than my residing here at Rome might be to you in Egypt. Yet if you there did practice on my state, your being in Egypt might be my question. How intend you practice? You may be pleased to catch at mine intent by what did here befall me. Your wife and brother made wars upon me, and their contestation was theme for you. You were the word of war. You do mistake your business. My brother never did urge me in his act. Of this, my letters before did satisfy you. If you'll patch your quarrel as a matter whole, you have not to make it with it. Must not be with this. <laughs> as for my wife... Would we had all such wives that the men might go to wars with the women? <laughs> I wrote to you. When rioting in Alexandria, you did pocket up my letters and with taunts did jibe my missive out of audience. Oh, sir, he fell upon me and admitted. Then three kings that I newly feasted and did want of what I was in the morning. <laughs> but next day I told him of myself, which was as much as to have asked him pardon. <laughs> oh, let this fellow be nothing in her strife. You have broken the article of your oath. Which you shall never have tongue to charge me with. Soft Caesar. Oh, well, Epirus, let him speak. But on, Caesar. The article of my oath. To lend me arms and aid when I required them. The which you both denied. Oh, neglected, rather. <laughs> the truth is, uh, Fulvia, to have me out of Egypt, made wars here. For the which myself, the ignorant motive, do so far ask pardon as befits mine honor to stoop in such a case. Tis noble spoken. If it might please you to enforce no further the griefs between ye, to forget them both. Well, then is spoken, my Cenas. Or if you borrow one another's love, you may, when you hear no more works of Pompey, return it again. You shall have time to wrangle in when you have nothing else to do. Thou art a soldier only, speak no more. The truth should be silent, I almost forgot. No wrong this presence. I will speak no more. Go to, then. Your considerate stone. I do not much dislike the matter, but the manner of his speech. But it cannot be we shall remain in friendship, our conditions so differing in their acts. Yet if I knew what hoop should hold us staunch, from edge to edge of the world, I should pursue it. Give me leave, Caesar. Speak, Agrippa. Thou hast a sister by the mother's side, admired Octavia. Great Mark Antony is now a widower. Say not so, Agrippa. If Cleopatra heard you, your reproof were well deserved of rashness. I am not married, Caesar. Let me hear Agrippa further speak. To hold you in perpetual amity, to make you brothers, and to knit your hearts with an unslipping knot, take Antony Octavia unto his wife whose beauty claims no worse a husband than the best of men, whose virtue and whose general graces speak that which none else can utter. By this marriage, all little jealousies that now seem great and all great fears that now import their dangers would then be nothing. Pardon what I have spoken, for it is a studied, not a present thought, by duty ruminated. Will Caesar speak? Not till he hears how Antony is touched with what is spoke already. What power is in Agrippa, if I would say Agrippa, be it so, to make this good? The power of Caesar and his power unto Octavia. Let me have the hand. Further, this act of grace, and from this hour, the heart of brothers govern in our loves and sway our great design. Where's my hand? A sister I bequeath you, whom no brother did ever love so dearly. Let her live to join our kingdoms and our hearts, and never fly off our loves again. Happily, amen. I did not think to draw my sword against Pompey. <laughs> For he hath laid strange courtesies and great of late upon me. The time calls upon us. Of us must Pompey presently be thought, or else he seeks out us. Well, I see. About the Mount Mycenaeum. What's his strength by land? Great and increasing, but by sea he is an absolute master. Oh, oh haste we for it. 
Uh, yet ere we put ourselves in arms, dispatch we the uh, business we have talked on with most gladness. And to invite you to my sister's view with a straight, I'll lead you. Let us, Lepidus, not lack your company. Noble Anthony, <laughs> not thickness should detain me. <laughs> from Egypt, sir. Half the heart of Caesar worthy, my Mycenaeus. My honorable friend, ah, Agrippa. Ah, Codine of Arvin. Oh, we have cause to be glad that matters are so uh, well digested. Uh, you stayed well by it in Egypt. Aye, sir. We slept the day out of countenance and made the night light with drinking. Hmm. Eight wild boars roasted whole at a breakfast and but <laughs> twelve persons there. Is this true? Well, this was but a fly by an eagle. We had a much more monstrous matter of feast which worthily deserved noting. She is a most triumphant lady, if report be squared her. When she first saw Mark Antony, she pursed up his heart on the river of Sidness. There she appeared indeed, or my reporter devised well for her. I will tell you. The barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold of tissue, all picturing that Venus wherein we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys like smiling cupids with diverse colored fans whose winds did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool and what they undid did oh, rare for Antony. Her gentle women like the Nereids so many mermaids tended her the eyes and made their bends adornings. At the helm, a seeming mermaid steers. The silken tackle swells with the touches of those flower-soft hands that yearly frame the office. From the barge, a strange invisible perfume hits the scents of the adjacent wharves. The city cast its people out upon her, and Antony enthroned in the marketplace did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for vacancy had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. Rare Egyptian. Upon her landing, Antony sent to her, invited her to supper. She replied it should be better he became her guest, which she entreated. Our courteous Antony, whom ne'er the word of no woman heard speak, being barbered ten times o'er, goes to the feast. And for his ordinary, pays his heart for what his eyes eat only. Uh, royal wench. She made great Caesar lay his sword to bed. He ploughed her, and she cropped. <laughs> now Antony must leave her utterly. Never. He will not. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetites they feed. But she makes hungry where most she satisfies. For vilest things become themselves in her. But the holy priests bless her when she is riggish. If beauty, wisdom, modesty can settle the heart of Antony, Octavia is a blessed lottery to him. Mm. Let us go. Good dean of Arbus, make yourself my guest whilst you abide here. Humbly, sir, I thank you. The world and my great office will sometime divide me from your bosom. All which time, before the gods, my knees shall bow my prayers to them for you. Good night, sir. Uh, my Octavia. <sighs> Read not my blemishes in the world's report. I have not kept my square, but <laughs> that to come shall all be done by the rule. Good night, dear lady. Good night, sir. Now, sir, you know 
wish yourself in Egypt. Would I had never come from thence, nor you thither. If you can, your reason. I see it in my motion. <laughs> Have it not in my tongue. But yet hie you to Egypt again. Say to me, whose fortune shall rise higher? Caesar's or mine? Caesar's. Therefore, O oh Antony, stay not by his side. Thy demon, that thy spirit which keeps thee, is noble, courageous, high, unmatchable, where Caesar's is not. But near him, thy angel becomes a fear as being o'erpowered. Therefore, make space enough between you. Speak this no more. To none but thee. No more but when to thee. Get thee gone. Be it art or happy, it's spoken true. The very dice obey him. Out to Egypt. And though I make this marriage for my peace, in the east my pleasure lies. <laughs> Give me some music. The music home. Music. Moody food of us that trade in love. Let it alone. Let's to billiards. Come, Carmion. My arm is sore. Let's play with Mardian. <laughs> as well a woman with an unit played as with a woman. Come. <laughs> You'll play with me, sir. As well as I can, madam. <laughs> and when goodwill is shown, though it come too short, the actor may plead pardon. Oh, no, no. Give me mine angle. Wheel to the river. There my music playing far off. I will betray tawny fin to fishes. My bended hook shall pierce their slimy jaws. And as I draw them up, I'll think them every one an Antony and say, aha, your courts. It was merry when you wagered on your angling. When your diver did hang a salt fish on his hook, <laughs> which he with fervency drew up. That time, oh, times, I laughed him out of patience. And that night I laughed him into patience. And the next morning, at the ninth hour, I drunk him to his bed. Then put my tires and mantles on him whilst I wore his sword, Philippin. <laughs> oh, rock Italy! Fruitful tidings in mine ears that long time have been barren. Madam, madam. Antonius dead. If thou say so, villain, thou killest thy mistress. But well and free, if thou so yield him, there is gold. And here my bluest veins to kiss a hand that kings have lipped and to tremble to kiss him. First, madam, he is well. Why, there's more gold. Sir Mark, we used to say the dead are well. Bring it to that, the gold I give thee will I melt and pour down thy ill uttering throat. Madam, hear me. Have a mind to strike thee and thou speakest. Yet if thou say Antony lives, is well, or friends with Caesar, or not captive to him, I'll set thee in a shower of gold and hail rich pearls upon thee. Madam, he's well. Well said. And friends with Caesar. Thou art an honest man. Caesar and he are quicker friends than ever. <laughs> Make thee a fortune from me. But yet... Madam, I do not like but yet. It does lay the good precedence. Fie upon but yet. But yet is as a jailer to bring forth some monstrous malefactor. Prithee, friend, pour forth the pack of matter to mine other good and bad together. He's friends with Caesar in state of health, thou sayest, and thou sayest free. Free, madam? No. I made no such report. He's bound... And to Octavia. For what good turn? For the best turn in the bed. I'm pale, Carmion. Madam, he's married to Octavia. 
the most infectious pestilence upon thee. Good madam, patience. What sayest thou? Intolerable villain! Oh! For I have spurned thine eyes like balls before me. I'll unhair thy head. Thou shalt be whipped with wire and stewed in brine, smarting and lingering pickle. Good madam, either to bring the news, may not the man. Oh, say it is not so. A province I will give thee and make thy fortunes proud. The blow thou hadst shalt make thy peace for moving me to rage. Yes, married, madam. Rogue, thou hast lived too long. What mean you, madam? Oh, madam, keep yourself within yourself. The man is innocent. Some innocent escape not the thunderbolt. Melt Egypt into Nile and kindly creatures turn all to serpents. The slave again. Though I'm mad, I will not bite him. Call. He is afeard to come. I will not hurt him. His hands do lack nobility, but they strike a meaner than myself, since I myself have given myself the cause. Come hither, sir. <laughs> Though it is honest, it is never good to bring bad news. <laughs> Give to a gracious message and host of tongues, but let ill tidings tell themselves when they be felt. I've done my duty. Is he married? <laughs> I cannot hate thee worse than I do if thou again say yes. He's married, madam. God's confound thee, dost thou hold there still? Should I lie, madam? Oh, I would thou didst. So half my Egypt were submerged and made a system for scaled snakes. Go, get thee hence. Had thou Narcissus in thy face to me, thou wouldst appear most ugly. <laughs> he is married? I crave your highness pardon. He's married? Take no offense that I would not offend you. To punish me for what you make me do seems much unequal. <laughs> He's married to a savior. Oh, that his fault should make a slave of thee that art not. What thou art sure of. Get thee hence. The merchandise which thou hast bought from Rome are all too dear for me. Lie thee upon thy hand and be undone by them. Would your highness patience? In praising Antony, I have dispraised Caesar. Many times. I'm paid for it now. Lead me from hence. I faint. Oh, Iris, calm you. It is no matter. Go to the fellow, good Alexis. Bid him report the feat of Octavia, her years, her inclination. Let him not leave out the color of her hair. Bring me word quickly. Let him forever go. Oh, let him not calm you. Though he be painted one way like a gorgon, the other way is a mouse. Bid you, Alexis, bring me word how tall she is. Pity me, calm you. But do not speak to me. Lead me to my chamber. 